it's going to be interesting, Josh, when they mix uh, Pat Maroon into this in a few weeks, uh, when he comes back from back surgery. Big rig. And, and they figure out a way uh, to get him involved with with the other. That is his nickname, by the way. Like, just, yeah. you know, that his nickname is the big rig. Like, Don't I mean, worry, you're not going to have any Jack Edwards type situations here. Gosh, Josh. Like, <laughs> you can call you can call Pat Maroon the big rig all day long on the Fucks with Hacks podcast. Okay, so, I, I'm pretty sure that's his nickname. Uh, yes. I've, heard, I've heard him refer to as that. I don't um, think he's going to track you down or anything. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast. I believe this is the 72nd episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Joe Haggerty. You can find my work at joehaggerty.substack.com. Uh, get a premium membership going. You can get all of my NHL and, and Bruins writing sent straight directly to your inbox. I also write columns for the Boston Sports Journal after every single Bruins game. We'll have one uh, up right now about that 5-1 to one stink bomb loss for the Bruins to the St. Louis Blues on Monday night. So check that out. Uh, with me today, a couple of great guests. We have uh, Anchor on XM Sports Network, uh, NFL radio host and longtime contributor, uh, to Sirius XM NHL Network, Zig Fracassi. Zig, thanks for joining us, buddy. Hags, it's been too long. How you been? I- I've been great, and you are clearly uh, you didn't pay your electricity bill this month because you're <laughs> you're a black box over there right now. Uh, Sorry, because right, we can hear you loud and clear, and uh, the beautiful dulcet tones of the radio voice, Zig. I can hear it very well. Longtime hockey writer Josh Cooper uh, with us as well. Uh, Josh Coop, how's it going on the West Coast, buddy? Good, good. So if this is the 72nd podcast, does that make it the Frank Petrano Bruins era? <laughs> I, I, I think it does. We we had the Gronk uh, episode, the 69th uh, episode of the podcast. Thank <laughs> the Gronk you know, many Gronkowski jokes at that point. <laughs> but uh, before we get into the show, thank you guys for joining us. I just want to thank our sponsor real quick, too. Uh, Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks. You simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. For example, David Pasternak, you can pick how many shots on net he's going to get in the game, more or less. Uh, Charlie McAvoy blocks shots, uh, all kinds of statistical categories like that. It's fun and pretty simple. So download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's download the Prize Picks app today. Easy to download, easy to use. I actually did it uh, this week. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right. Um, let's start first things first, Zig. I'll, I'll let you get right out of the shoot since I know you want to talk Bruins. Uh, five to one loss to the St. Louis Blues last night. Um, down two to nothing at the end of the first period. Took three penalties in the first period. Horrible start to that game. Zero engagement. Zero intensity. Um, exactly kind of what you expect to see out of good teams that have wrapped up their playoff spots when they play teams that are just playing out the string and and playing for jobs and all that stuff. And really. When you look at it, um, the way things have gone for the Boston Bruins uh, since the All-Star break, they're losing to every team like the St. Louis Blues. They've lost to Calgary twice. Uh, They've lost to Washington. They got blown out by the Islanders. They lost to Seattle, blown out by the Blues last night, lost to the Kings. So basically, if you're not in the playoffs right now, the Bruins are just kind of rolling over and and, uh, playing dead against you uh, and, and just not giving you a game. They're still competing hard against the playoff teams and they had some good games this uh, past two weeks against Toronto and uh, Edmonton. And then uh, obviously the Pittsburgh game, the big city greens classic, they took care of the penguins. Uh, But it looks like uh, the teams uh, they're taking teams for granted that come in here. that are not playoff teams. What did you see last night against the blues zig? And what have you seen lately out of the Bruins? Hags, I couldn't agree any more with you because usually you get a tip on when a team is engaged or not. Like when they got that first power play, not even what minute into the game, and they're treating the puck like it's a ping pong ball. Yeah, you you, you 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 know that they're fighting it a little bit. And, and granted, they got on on the one goal. You know, it takes a funny carom off uh, the side boards there, but that doesn't happen if they clear the zone. Simple as that. And then they, they may have gotten screwed on that Razzo goal where it looked as though Krug actually played the puck back into the blue zone, but the refs ruled that it was not 
you know, at that particular point, uh, a play of possession, whatever the term that they used. So yep. bottom line is, Hags, that uh, they have played down to their competition. There's no question, and you pointed that out so very well, but they seem to be more engaged uh, against the better competition. Uh, they're clearly flawed. There's no question about that. They've had problems in their defensive zone all year long. Yep. Uh, they've been too reliant on, you know, the great goaltending tandem that they've had. And to me, their their bottom six hasn't been as consistent, although I'd like that uh, line with the, you know, the last four, or the last three there with Brazo and Boquist and um, Lauco last. I thought they yeah, were their best line. So, no doubt. So I, I don't see enough consistency. Maybe now a couple of days off practice. You know, they got Montreal on Thursday night, so it'll be interesting to see. But all in all, Hags, for what was supposed to be a so-called reset, rebuild year, top five in points, hey, anybody will take that before what's to come supposedly next year when they got more money to spend. Yeah, no doubt. And and I've oft looked at this and talked about that this year as being kind of a transition year for them where I, I actually liked what they did at the deadline because they recognized where they are, the flaws, yep. some of the flaws that they have that they weren't going to be able to address every single issue or weakness on the roster at the trade deadline. But they added some players that are going to help them in this particular playoff run, big, heavy physical players um to to help them give them a little bit of a push as they can but they weren't going to sacrifice prospects they weren't going to trade mm -hmm. their 2025 first round pick they weren't going to start trading players to create cap space under the illusion that this team is like a stanley cup favorite um i think in the east the only team that looks like a stanley cup favorite or a team that you would expect that is going to get that far uh, and have a chance to win is the florida panthers i think they've shown in the yep. second half that they're legit again that they're playing great hockey, that they're going to be a handful in the playoffs. Um, and, and I think Bruins fans could take heart and should take heart, though, that as much as you, you get on them for efforts like or lack of efforts like last night uh, against the Blues, you know, as Jim Montgomery said after the game, you know, we have 91 points. We're a good team. We just weren't a good team tonight. <laughs> it's, it's become right. that part of the year where – you know, Montgomery's not going to be cracking, uh, cracking, uh, you know, cracking his players over the head uh, every time they make a mistake and, and killing them uh, because they're losing a game that's going to look meaningless and is going to be forgotten next week. Um, it's about getting ready for the playoffs and making sure they're right for them and kind of the focus being on that. Josh, you covered uh, plenty of playoff teams in Nashville during your long run with the Preds. Uh, I'm sure you saw plenty of games in the second half like this where it was clear uh, the, the Predators just kind of, you know, kissed it goodbye and, and didn't really bring it and kind of just laid an egg as they were getting ready for the playoffs. Just, you know, it, it's tough that it happens, and I feel bad for the fans that fork out a lot of money for the seats to watch those kind of games. But, like, if you're a playoff team and everything is sewn up, I, I think these games happen in the second half of the year. Well, and the other thing, too, is remember, last year the Bruins were sort of coasting into the playoffs but still winning and yeah. look what happened to them yep. so i think there's something to be said for a grind mentality uh even though they may not be as deep as they were a year ago and you know they, they lost arguably my favorite player of the last 20 years and patrice bergeron yeah he and jay weber are like kind of up there for me it's like yep. one one a but uh, you know what's I, funny, Coop. I don't mean to cut you off. Like, and we're gonna get back right back to what you're saying. But what's amazing? Some one of the amazing things to me is you talk to, uh, and this has happened over the last few days. Linus Allmark, when he was talking about like sort of having a tough time, sort of dealing with the anxiety of if he was gonna get traded, and the first time he was really his name was tossed out there in trade rumors. And he mentioned that that a, a, a conversation and a text from Patrice Bergeron was really meaningful from him for him while this was all going That's on. Amazing. And He's I talked guy. to I talked to Jake DeBrusque yesterday similarly uh, about how he was worried about he was going to get traded. And this whole year has been stressful for him because it's so uncertain because he's in a free agent walk year. Uh, negotiations aren't really going well with the Bruins, uh, and it felt like either he was going to get traded or maybe he's going to leave in free agency at the end of the year. Um, so it's been a difficult year for him mentally too. And he talked about how Bergeron has reached out to him a bunch of times and just like, he's like, 
even though I played with the guy for as long as I did, I can't believe that a player like that will just out and out sometimes just like shoot me a text, say I'm thinking right. of you and things like that. So like it, it speaks to what they uh, a missed this year uh, and are trying to get past and sort of, you know, get over and move on from, but also B how he's still a presence like, and he's still like helping this team in ways, even though he's been retired for a while. He's a Bruins legend. He will always be a Bruin. And that's sort of the great thing about him is like, and I love Zidane Char also, but you know, he went yep. on and played other places. Like I don't look at him as sort of a Bruin forever versus Patrice Bergeron to me is a lifetime Bruin. And so he will always be there for these guys. And one of the things that's great that I always say to people in LA living out here is like, you don't know how really great a guy like Andre Kopitar truly is. Like he's a tremendous person on top of a tremendous player because we know these guys. Yep. Uh, and we know their their character, which is which is really awesome. Uh, and I always try to say that to people whenever I see anyone wearing a king shirt, and I'm like, I I've met this person. He's a great person. You know that you, we all know that about Patrice Bergeron too. But um, in, in regards to the Bruins, though, I just sort of think of again last year. We all thought they were going to cruise to the Cup final. That's just not how this works. Right. So and you can get hot and get rolling and get past you know the first round into the second round third like who knows i mean they they are deep enough to do that i love their d um or at least on the top end i love their d i love their goaltending um i do love even though he's his numbers are down this year i do love brad marchand um david posternock's a guy you always have to watch out for so yeah i mean like these games they happen but at the end of the day if you as long as you get in anything is possible. I mean, remember the Islanders a few years ago? Like yeah. when Barry, I mean, I know how much I love Barry Trotz as a coach yes. and now GM, what he's done in Nashville is unbelievable. But like, um, I just, I love what he, <laughs> I love what he's done there. But uh, the Islanders made the conference final two years in a row. Who saw that coming? Like with a team that nobody thought could get past the first round. So uh, I like Jim Montgomery as a coach. I think he's got the right mindset this year. They're not playing it safe. They're they're really going out there and like this is just how it works with most teams that make the playoffs and normalcy is good. Um, I, I just remember how Washington used to have all those great teams and then they would just wilt in the playoffs. Then the one year nobody saw them coming, they win the Stanley Cup. Not saying it's gonna happen with the Bruins this year because there's a lot of really good teams, but I I well, I would take this over last year as far as how they're getting in. But I would take this with Patrice Bergeron, not having him as a big problem. Yeah, I, and I agree with you in that respect, that I, facing some adversity, being pushed hard, being uh, forcing the players to ask each other tough uh, questions or have tough conversations in the locker room during the regular season and sort of sort all that stuff out so it's not a new experience or a new phenomenon or like just hitting you once the playoffs start, I yeah, think exactly. is definitely important. And I think that's something that, you know, they've gone through three or four tough stretches this year, and I think that's been very good for them uh, to do that uh, in contrast to last year where they just, like, rolled through everybody. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's a tournament season or the fight for a playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you could turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Testing my skills on Prize Picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize Picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds download the app today and use code clns for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars use the code clns for the first deposit match up to a hundred dollars pick more pick less it's that easy uh but i think it was also interesting the other day brad marchand was very like vocal about saying look if we don't play our hardest if we don't give everything we have we're we're not going to win even against average teams in the nhl like we can't just walk in and think our skill is going to take over and we're just going to blow teams out and overwhelm them with our depth like we did last year like we have to work hard we have to dig in defensively and basically be a team that's playing from the goaltending on out 
uh, if we're going to have success and we're going to win this year. And, uh, you know, I think it's good perspective that the leader says that and he has it, it, it definitely down and he knows exactly what this team is made of, how they're going to have success and that they're going to get shown up by the St. Louis Blues, the Calgary Flames twice, all these other teams um, if they're not bringing it and if they just kind of think they're going to show up and, and something good is going to happen. Zig, do you take any concern or you have any concern just of the phenomenon of playing down to competition, um, given that, you know, their record is overwhelmingly good against playoff caliber teams, teams that are in the playoff structure this year. Yeah, it can. Although technically Hags, if you look at it, the blues, well, I guess mathematically are still in the mix because they definitely are. They're about six points out of a wild card spot. So they're, they're playing for something. Clearly they were playing hard last night because they still are within shouting distance of the playoffs. Right. And and if you want to make an argument, you could say that they actually outplayed the Bruins when they played in St. Louis, but Boston wound up stealing two points. So maybe they had a little bit of uh, revenge on their mind. So, yep. you know, so yeah, I, it, to me, then, then that says, you know, are, are they mentally focused when they should be, you know, taking care of these bottom teams, but at the same time, I think along what Josh was saying here is too, maybe even last year when everything was going so well, they were trying to be, excuse me, so darn perfect that yep. when you're playing against even the teams that you're supposed to beat and you, you know, obliterate them, then, you know, do, do you spend too much energy doing that? So I think that's where Madi's trying to sort of fine tune this game. You know, now they got to be without Bergeron and Krejci in the playoffs. So I'm sure he's thinking of those adjustments. I think he, you know, maybe at some point you want to start inserting some kids out of Providence, get them a little bit of playing time and spell these guys. Like, for example, yesterday, if Coyle wasn't feeling 100% and they had Johnny Beecher on the ice for the pregame, why not play him? I know you're losing your top center, but at the same time, you're letting Coyle rest and then be ready for the next game and give Beecher, who's actually been good in Providence lately, give him, you know, a few shifts and that kind of thing. So I think they got to reconcile a few things. And obviously, I I, I see the rest of the schedule, Hags. I know uh, there's Carolina a couple times more, Florida a couple times more, Tampa yep. yet. But then you've got Montreal, you've got the Ottawa's, you've got some teams on there that you're going to, you, you would think that they should be able to beat rather handily. So to me, it's just going to be kind of, I would call it juggling gym. How do you try to get through these last 15 games? Which, by the way, I think they've played the most games already of everybody in the NHL. So yeah. you got that factor going for them too. So maybe a little fatigue setting in as well. Yeah, I, I mean, the fatigue thing is definitely real uh and i think that has hit them at times this year and i think part of that is because jim montgomery plays his top guys a little too much at times and agreed I that is yep. you know and, and part of it also was that he did not have a fourth line i think in the first half of the year that he felt could handle more than eight or nine minutes in a game right. um so it was problematic uh where you you're playing Pasternak 22 23 minutes a night you're playing a 35 year old brad marchand 20 minutes a night you're playing Charlie McAvoy, huge. I think he played 26 minutes last night. He's played big minutes totals a lot this year. Uh, Lindholm, when he gets healthy and he's fully up and operational, plays big minutes as well. Um, so there are players that I think he's he rides too hard, and I think there are times where they hit a little bit of a wall, and, and the fatigue definitely uh, affects the performance, and you can see that. A bright side of that game, and this was the classic game last night where – Montgomery said afterwards that the fourth line was our best line. And that is usually <laughs> almost That's always right. a slap at the rest of the team and a sign that the team lost when the right. hockey coach talks, waxes poetic about how great the fourth line was and that it was the best line. Uh, but it was in that game last night. Uh, Justin Brazo had that goal that ended up getting called back because it was challenged for offsides. Um, you know, whether that was a good call or not, we could argue that one all day. But like, you know, and it was a nice it was a great move by Brazo to take the puck down low. He got a bounce, but he got a bounce because he went down low with force and was crashing the net hard with the puck and doing exactly what a six foot five winger, a power forward type guy should be doing. And I've been impressed with him and, and uh, his willingness yep. Yep. Uh, to do that, yep. win battles, take the puck hard to the net, all that stuff. I like him a lot as a player. 
But they found something with him and Boquist playing center, who was 0 for 5 in the faceoff circle last night, continues to struggle to win faceoffs. But at least he's bringing speed, uh, two way hockey, 200 feet hockey, and, and an anxiety to the other team because of the speed that he has when he attacks them. And Loco, I, I think, is a good player too. Uh, and has been a very effective at times, can pop in a goal every once in a while, and certainly will play on the edge and is physical. Uh, it's going to be interesting, though, because it seems like they're starting to form an identity a little bit as a fourth line. It's going to be interesting, Josh, when they mix uh, Pat Maroon into this in a few weeks, uh, when he comes back from back surgery. Big rig. And, and they figure <laughs> out a way uh, to get him involved with, with the other. That is his nickname, by the way, like just, yeah. you know. That his nickname is the Big Rig. Like, don't I mean, worry, you're not going to have any Jack Edwards type situations here. Gosh, like, you, know, <laughs> you can call you can call Pat Maroon the Big Rig all day long on the Pucks with Hacks podcast. Okay, I, I'm pretty sure that's his nickname. Uh, yes. I've heard I've heard him refer to as that. I don't um, think he's going to track you down or anything. Okay, like well, that. he's also been great to me in my career as far as giving me interviews and stuff. So I've always been appreciative. And I just like, yeah. shout out to him. That that's just his nickname, but. Uh, you know what's fascinating, though? You mentioned adding Pat Maroon. I'm just thinking, first off, I mean, that guy's a winner, and he's just won everywhere. So um, adding him is great. But this is just such an NHL thing, right? I'm looking at the standings right now, and if when you add essentially the overtime losses, the Bruins are only 38-29. and 29. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. like... It's they would so drop crazy. down in the standings if it was about regulation wins. There's no question. I mean, I'm looking at, say, the Red Wings right here. They're essential... And we're talking about how, oh, you know, rebirth of the Red Wings this year. They're essentially 33 and 31. Yep. I mean, it's just... It's so and, wild. And, guys, can I interject here just for a second just to further up Josh's point? And, Pags, I put this out on my uh, X account there at Zig Sports Voice. A team like the Bruins could finish... 41, 21, and 20. So if yep. you look at the mathematics, that says 102 points, right? That's a yep. good year. Yep. But if you use Josh's logic, which is so accurate, that's a 500 season. Yep. Think about that. They're, well, they're approaching they're approaching the NHL record for overtime shootout losses. Uh, yeah. it's, it's 18. And uh, <laughs> oh. they, would, they would break the record if they get to 20. But it, it speaks to a couple of different things. It speaks to that they're not good in overtime at all. Just bad three-on-three -three overtime team. It won't matter in the playoffs, which is But good. no, which, yeah, oh, correct. That doesn't enough. matter in the playoffs, but it also speaks to their inability to extend leads in the third period, and they're constantly white-knuckling one-goal games in the third period where they're blowing leads and then yep. going overtime. That has happened a lot. They've allowed a lot of goals when the other team pulls their goalie in the final minutes. Those are the kind of things when you watch this team day in and day out that you know is going to come back to haunt them come playoff time when it's going to be tight one goal games everywhere and they're not going to be able to close teams out in the third period. Oh, I mean, and that and that's something I remember covering Nashville. What was so important was that Barry Trotz, when he was the head coach there, and I saw him do this in Washington. I saw him do this. I mean, as you can tell, I'm a card-carrying member of the Barry Trotz fan club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, hey, he's a hell of a coach. This, but, but he's also probably a Hall of Fame coach at this point. So, yeah, I mean. Absolutely. I mean, he they would lock leads down. Like, one goal, they knew how to shut it down. And it's hard. especially, And it's, it was easier back then when offense wasn't as good. Well, now, it's also easier when you have Shea Weber. Like, uh, and Ryan Sue. Yeah. yeah. And, and Ryan Sue, yep. Roman that, on the that's, second kind of the, pair. that's kind of the difference now is like Charlie McAvoy. I love him as defenseman. He's a so really great. good defenseman. He's very Drew Doughty esque, but he's not Zdeno Char when it comes to shutting down yeah. uh, the other team at the end of games. And neither is Hampus Lindholm. Uh, they don't have that classic sort of shut down guy that's just going to lock it down at the end of games uh, on the back end, like, you know, winning battles in front of the net. And they also don't have Patrice Bergeron anymore, who used to always play in those situations, win face-offs, where it wouldn't, they, they could get it out of the zone and avoid all that trouble in their own end. So yeah. you can put those two things together, and you can see why they have trouble at late in games. So so I'm going to actually make a really weird assumption here on that. Maybe it's because the kids like playing video games too much, and they like the offense too much. The younger <laughs> well, that's part of it, too. Could be. And they don't like right. to play defense nearly as much as, say, Zdeno Chara, you know, who I believe would read books, you know, or Patrice Bergeron. <laughs> or, I'm just kidding. I'm not. Nine really languages. Yeah. That. Uh, but, I mean, but you're talking about guys who are 
had incredible sense and size and were really genetic and in some respects mental freaks as yep. far as how how good they were not but don't forget pecorine too was the first like huge yep. goaltender who could yep. move that fast in nashville so but yeah but you need but but the bruins have great goalies too they really have incredible goaltending um they should be able to lock these leads down but yeah i just go i, I mean i'm just honestly hags and zig like looking up and down the nhl standings the islanders are essentially in a playoff spot and they are for like if you count overtime losses they are 29 and 35. I mean, and it, it's <laughs> there's so much parity in this league. I wouldn't yep. be shocked if the Bruins like lost the game to Ottawa down the stretch. But that's just the way the league is right now. And that's why I also have incredible faith that the Bruins could go on a run in the playoffs, is because there the is so much parity. And, and the goaltending. Like the, yeah, the goal is the equalizer. And that they're not the favorite this year. Yeah. Which is great. Yep. It's great. Now the pressure's on Florida. Florida's right. the team that everyone, nobody saw coming except one person who was a former athletic writer who picked them to go to the Stanley Cup final right here. His name's uh, Josh Cooper. <laughs> yeah. But but that's only because nobody saw them come nobody saw them coming. So I could see the Bruins going on a run like that because I do think they have a lot of really good pieces. They're very well coached and you know who? I, I mean, I could see it happening. Is it likely? No, but like, I mean, I could see it happening. We do have Factor Meals uh, to help us out. America's number one ready to eat meal kit when it does get busy, when it does get crazy, when we do need a, a quick meal. Uh, they fuel you up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. Takes less than two minutes to cook them. They're fresh, never frozen. Meals ready in two minutes, like I said. Uh, they have calorie conscious options going upscale with some of the things they're offering now, like surf and turf, surf and surf meal options, roasted garlic, filet mignon and shrimp and Cajun spiced shrimp and salmon, which is like right in my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff I'm all about. So it's got everything for everybody. Uh, there's 34 plus chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options for meals. Uh, you can get snacks, you can get breakfast items. Like it's, it's, it's a great deal. Um, so if you want to get factor meals, uh, go to factormeals.com slash hags50 and use the code hags50 to get 50% off of your fir first box. It's a great deal. Uh, you know, I I've tried it. It's fantastic. I recommend it to you. We love these ready to, to make meal kits, especially when we're, we're on the go with our kids. So one more time, that's factormeals.com slash hags50 to get 50% off your first box. You won't be sorry if you go to Factor Meals. It gets the hags thumbs up seal of approval. I think with their goaltending, anything is possible in the playoffs, uh, especially if like Jeremy Swayman, who it's really been his year, you know, he's really stepped up and elevated his game and kind of ascended to another level. And if he all of a sudden gets hot in the playoffs and, and starts throwing together performances, I think that could change the dynamic quite a bit. Um, as it would with any team, like that gets a hot goal in the playoffs. That is still a, a phenomenon that I very much believe in uh, that can give you success. Um, Zig, some great defensive efforts before this St. Louis game, um, allowed one goal in regulation and four straight yep. to Toronto twice, Edmonton once and Pittsburgh, uh, once again, in that big city greens classic game that we love so much. Yeah. Uh, so do you, how much did you read into those four performances against high wattage offenses? Really, really good offensive, uh, players, as to like them being able when the time is right to step up the defensive play uh, to be better defensively in front of their uh, elite goaltending and, and frankly play the way that you're going to have to play in the playoffs to have success. Well, I, I think it was um, after the Islanders game when Matty got into the grill of the leadership group and he didn't reveal what he said, but you could yeah. tell that there was an emphasis hags that Monday night game in Toronto to really clamp things down. Now, granted, yep. it wasn't total perfection, but it was clearly a message that they were playing, you know, both ends of the ice very well. Uh, so they clamped them down the Monday night. And then Tuesday, they, they should have beat Edmonton. If if Heinen hits the empty net there, make it 2 nothing. I don't yep. think you get to overtime. And then, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters that are the Oilers there with yes. Dreisaitl and McDavid win it. 
in overtime. So I thought that was kind of a misnomer. Uh, I thought they took advantage of the rematch against Toronto because they had a tough game against Buffalo the night before, but still very solid defensively. Then the game, Hags, like you called the Big Green Special there, which I can tell you're a, you're a big fan of there. And it's kind of oh, my, my son, my 10 year old son lives uh, Big City Greens. So he it's was cool. Big, big I, I enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. But uh, to that point, now they granted they allowed over 40 shots. I mean, Pittsburgh was taking a ton of shots, but I think that was a game, Hags, where maybe that was a statement uh, by Allmark to management like, uh, you're not trading me here. And I don't doubt for a minute that Donnie was pursuing trades, by the way. I, I honestly think, and I know Elliot Friedman was reporting about that. No, he definitely did. The, and it seems like it was the Kings that was the destination, right? Y- yes, but the thing is, the Allmark trade wasn't just going to happen by itself. The Allmark trade was going to be part of a, do- a, a some domino dominoes yeah. to, to, to make another move. Right, because it, you weren't going to get a lot for Allmark. The only reason you were going to trade Allmark is to get salary cap space, um, right. you know, and, and a little freedom to be able to make another move or two. Because, like, let let you know, anybody that has covered the league for a while knows you're not going to get a lot of value for trading goalies. Like, you're just not going to, even if no. it's a reigning Vesna Trophy winner, you're not going to get some like young NHL guy that's going to be an impact player for you, some like top prospect. You're not going to get a first round pick. Like you're not going to get any of that stuff if you're trading uh, Linus Elmark, even if he does agree uh, to waive his no trade and go somewhere else. But I, there were two things going on in that game against Pittsburgh. You're absolutely right. There was um, Linus Elmark, uh, Jake DeBrusque, like a number of Bruins players playing extremely well. I think with the weight of the trade trade deadline off of their absolutely shoulders, when they were they were sticking yep. around, just playing free. Uh, almost celebratory the way they were playing that they didn't get traded and that, you know, the anxiety was over and and you could tell just by the way that they were playing. Now, on the other hand, Pittsburgh, I think that was like a one game protest for them trading Jake Gunsel. I, I, you, yeah. I had never seen bigger no shows from Evgeny Malkin and Sidney Crosby in my life than that game where I don't think either one of them had a shot on net. Like how often does that happen in the history of the Pittsburgh Penguins where both of them are just ghosts in the same game uh, and I think that was because they were upset that they're sellers now and their their situation. And, you know, uh, uh, I think Coop wants to get into this, but them being pissed off at Kyle Dubas uh, for trading uh, one of their guys and, and for sort of waving the white flag, which is something Pittsburgh is not used to uh, come trade deadline time. So let's let's wing around the league a little bit and Coop uh, hit us on Dubas and, and Pittsburgh and anything else you want to talk about league wide. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it does. It's crazy to see Pittsburgh being sellers. Sidney Crosby is one of my favorite players to have covered in my entire life. Um, it's like that generation of Canadian guys that won the gold medal in 2010, yep. which I know that um, Bergeron's USA, part of that too. Yep. Yeah. And Bergeron, Shea Weber, like all those guys. And you yep. just sort of move onwards, Chris Pronger. Um, you know, the 2016 World Cup, also those guys watching them play, the way they played, the professionalism with, with which they acted was second enough um so and i love Sidney crosby and i love watching him play and to see the penguins be sellers and not just that they traded one of his guys like jake gensel is a crosby guy we know crosby can't play with i don't want to say can't play but he does he seems to mesh better with grinder type guys than sort of these kind of fluff goal scorers right and jake gensel was one of Sidney Crosby's guys and so him to get traded and you have a new GM in there you had high expectations coming into the season with Eric Carlson coming in it didn't work I mean what's but also we have to look at the fact that Kyle Dubas wasn't left with a lot either in regards to Ron Hextall kind of destroyed a lot of what had been built up before very yeah, top I mean, heavy yeah it's uh, an aging it's an aging yeah group. it's a needs- hard that needs to be like the Bruins are doing. That's that they're sort of facing. They're about a year or two behind the Bruins as far as that like transition goes. You can see it coming where their aging guys are going to be phased out eventually, and they've got to like pivot to some younger players. And well, but you still have got. I mean, with the exception of Carlson, you still have Malkin and Crosby under contract at good rates, right? Who are performing above their contract level and. 
to me, that's the biggest thing is how did this happen? And I could see the protest. You know, I'm at the point now where I'm just like, trade Sid, get him someplace where he can win one more cup. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll, I mean, I, there was always the joke that one of the Bruins players, I think it was Marshawn, was going to Pittsburgh. Well, it's like, well, maybe Sid goes to Boston. Yeah. Like, I, I, I have, play with I have, his Nova Scotia buddy uh, Brad that he works that's out right. with. That. I know, I know. Maybe they send him to Colorado to play with Nathan McKinnon, uh, right. another one of his friends. Well, here's I, two guys. I, here's two things I would add to that conversation. One, and to Josh's point about Malkin, should they have traded him or Latang maybe a year earlier? And two, let's not forget they got a new ownership group now. Yeah, Fenway Group, Hag knows obviously from the time in Boston. Yes. I start to wonder too, where are the priorities with them? Because you've got the Red Sox, they own soccer teams. If I'm a Penguins fan or a Red Sox fan, I'm starting to wonder. Yeah. Do these do these guys have my are they going to be competitive because they got too many irons in the fire? Yeah. No, the portfolio is the, the priority. Right. Uh, Fenway Sports Group. It's right. not any of those teams. It's it's the you know collection of uh the, the business and the, the portfolio and how it performs. Like I I I, I knew it was gonna take a few years for them to really sort of um flex their muscle ownership wise and do what they want to do. Uh, but it's going to turn into what the Red Sox are, which is they don't spend money. They're not competitive. Right. Um, you know, and, and uh, Red Sox <laughs> are pissed now. They really are. Red they Sox are. are Josh, it's legit. Man. And rightfully so with the team, especially the prices that they pay to go to Fenway Park and, and the payroll uh, that they should have and have had in the past. So and I, think, he's yeah, like, and I think he's yeah. beloved here now. Seriously. And I think right. that's starting to happen with Pittsburgh too. But like to Zig's point, I mean, I, when they locked all these aging players up to extensions and didn't trade any of them, I was like, this is not going to end well. Um, it's not going to end well for Mike Sullivan either. Um, he yeah, stinks. A very I good love coach. That guy. Yeah, he's an excellent coach, but like he's in a tough spot right now where he's got aging players with egos that are locked into that have contract security and. You know, there's not much he can do except keep playing, keep rolling them out there and playing them, and hope uh, that you know that the the results are different. That, um, that you've seen it the last back. couple of years where they're a borderline playoff team or not in at all. It it seeing Sid play for nothing, it, it's it sucks. Like it yeah. really does because when he's playing for something, I remember my favorite NBA player was Dirk Nowitzki. And when sure. he had something to play for in the playoffs, watching him just like go from regular season Dirk, who was a good player, to postseason Dirk, who just like, with the exception of a couple series that I recall, um, yep. just completely dominate and become a different player. And you see that with NBA players all the time because their regular season's so long. I mean, that's just what Sid is like the beautiful backhand, like the way he just is the first guy in the corner getting hit, making the play. I mean, that's him in the playoffs. And I, well, it's going to be a very fascinating summer for him. There there was one thing I didn't want to talk about, Hags, and you know this very well. Yes, and, talk about it, Josh. Yeah, so I see the Bruins have the two spot right now. The Maple Leafs have the three. <laughs> so at least we know the Bruins will get to the second round of the playoffs. Oh, oh here we go. <laughs> there it is. Hurting feelings up in Toronto. I mean... It, at least you don't have to, when they make a trade, at least we're not like, what does Kyle Dubas know that we don't know? <laughs> now, what does he think he knows that we don't? Yes, Joel Edmondson. Whoa. <laughs> it's like, we, we're not thinking that with Brad for living. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, I, another team that the, I mean, a team that the, a longtime Bruins antagonist. Actually, wait, if you have to be an antagonist, you have to actually beat the team, right? So yeah, that correct. means that they're not the antagonists. They're just, you know, another yeah, it's team. not a rivalry if it's one-sided and the Bruins just keep kicking the crap out of the Toronto Maple Leafs when they play them in the playoffs. That's I know, I know. It's not I a mean, rivalry yeah, until the other side actually wins uh, wins a round. But, I mean, look, they do have a guy who scores a lot of goals in Austin Matthews. It's the hardest thing to do in the NHL is to score goals. So yep. maybe that's the X factor in the playoffs, but – I need to see it from him. I still think David Pasternak, like money down, one game, winner take all. You have to pick one superstar between those two. I'm taking 
Pasternak, even though he had a bit of a lackluster postseason last year. But that's a write-off for everyone. Uh, but I think right now, if the Bruins play the Maple Leafs in the first round, I'm, I'm at least taking the Bruins, which again gives me hope because then for the Bruins, because then you can go to the second round and who knows what happens. Yeah. So, Once you get out of the wild west of the first round, as, uh, as your namesake, uh, the coach down there in Tampa Bay, uh, was fond of saying, like, anything can happen. You know, it's about getting right. out of the, the craziness of the first round. Um, and, making sure that you can advance and then once you you get out of that first round things get a little sort of more normal uh biorhythmically in the playoffs and you can get a little more of a pulse for it but like there's so yeah. many crazy things that happen in the first round of the playoffs so many like teams that go into the playoffs whether it's teams that have like lo long since locked up their postseason bid or teams that were like playing like it was the playoffs for the last six weeks of the season, when those two teams sort of meet each other in the first round, I think a lot of insane, crazy things can happen yeah. because they're at such different intensity levels to start things off. And it doesn't even even up usually in those first round series until you get a few games into it. And then by that point, it can be too late. If a, a really hungry team that's, you know, been playing for their lives for two months, all of a sudden, you know, wins a couple games right out of the bat and, and has the other team down, uh, you know, has a stranglehold on the other team. Uh, Zig, anything yes, um, league-wide that you have seen that you're hot on or that you want to talk about or any observations you have that you want to throw out there right now? Well, it's going to be interesting, Hags, with to see uh, the man Mountain Dean there, the new phenom for the Rangers, Rempe. I guess he's going to have a hearing today. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I was going to talk about this too. I love it. Yeah, because uh, let's face it, he is not backed down from any challenge, and you got to yeah. like that about the young man. And he, if you stand him in front of the net, the Rangers could score every time on the power play if they wanted. But uh, the elbowing incident last night against uh, New Jersey, uh, you know, wound up being, I think it was a five minute penalty and all that. So yeah. I'm going to be curious how much, um, how many games he gets because he's not a prior. Uh, offender and I know uh, McDermott, the tough guy that the Devils just got, said he lost respect for him. I mean, the guy's been in the league for what five minutes, and it's amazing yeah. that you got all this respect already. But maybe there's a team now, Hags, that, that's kind of shortchanged the last few years. The Rangers uh, maybe getting with it because I think they are dangerous coming out of the East. I believe that I, I agree with you. I mean, they've got a ton of skill. They've got a lot of players that are in their like late twenties that are very good, that are kind of in the prime of their career. Ryder, yep. Panarin. The playoffs go like you go down the list and they've got a lot of young talent on that team. They've got very good goaltending. Um, you know, Rempe, I think adds an X factor too. And like, you know, I, I heard some of the McDermott stuff. I heard Mike Johnson on NHL Network on TV uh, kind of ripping Rempe a little bit, really, like, disparaging him for, for you know, not only the hit, but also, like, waving goodbye to everybody when he was leaving and, you know, the histrionics after he was right, getting thrown right. out of the game. And, like, kind of saying, like, guys around the league are going to lose respect for him. Um, but, like... I don't think he cares. Like, I think he strikes me as a guy that approaches, like he's got a Tom Wilson kind of approach uh, to the way he plays. And he knows, and this was the way Brad Marchand was when he first came up with the Bruins, is he had in his head that if he didn't play that way, he wasn't going to stay in the league. Like, right. that was the only way he was going to be able to stick around. That's how he was going to carve out an identity. That's how he was going to, you know, win his bones and carve out his niche in the NHL was to be a guy that was playing on the edge that might throw a questionable hit, you know, every now and then that might get suspended a few times that was going to like keep stepping on the line and over the line to see how many times he could do it um, versus how many times he was going to get in trouble for it. And I, I think Rempe is that kind of guy. He's not going to dazzle you with his skill. He's not going to be the kind of player that's going to be, you know, scoring Trevor Zegras goals and getting kids trying the Michigan and hockey practices everywhere <laughs> uh, from here to Peoria uh at youth hockey practices because they just look at his hands and they look what he does with the puck and they're amazed this is a giant massive piece of physicality that can be a factor with the big body around the net certainly will score his share of goals and has shown he can play a little bit no doubt no doubt about it but he's going to make it and he's going to stay in the league by being physical by going after guys by throwing big hits by fighting when he's challenged especially early in his career when he first comes up by making a name for himself 
where from now on, when somebody is looking for a big physical forward, they're going to say to themselves, we need a Matt Rempe kind of player. Like he, he, he will turn into that because there's so few guys right. that play like that in the league now. So like, I, do I, did I lose respect for Rempe for any of the stuff that he did last night? No, I didn't. Because I think I've thought from the time I watched him play, that's like a Tom Wilson. Like he's definitely trying to play that style and he wants to come in, yep. you know, really be bold, like make people create a lot of anxiety on the other team, stir the crap up and, and you know, play physical and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that you brought that up, Zig, because I was, I was thinking the same thing. Like I wanted to talk about it because uh, I've really liked the way the guys played. I don't think there's enough players in the league that play that way, to be honest with you. I think sometimes the NHL is way too comfortable with the way that they play. Um, way too many guys are comfortable where there's not enough guys like this that are like bringing that intensity during the regular season. And, and I think there needs to be a little more of that. And certainly guys that would be willing to drop the gloves uh, when the, when the situation calls for it. And, and I, I think, him getting the notoriety that he's gotten, him getting people talking like he has, I think the NHL should be paying attention to that. And I think more players that are his size and strength level should be paying attention to that. Oh, absolutely. Like, and him being in New York too. Go ahead, Josh. No, I was going to say, I'd like to see where he was on like prospect ratings. I haven't even honestly looked at it. Yeah. Question. yeah. This season. Um, just only because, you know, how do you, whiff on like the number one and number two pick essentially if you're the rangers and then you get hit so like well <laughs> that guy um yep. it, it it blows my mind i'm sorry ziggy I'll, I'll let you go no no no. i was just gonna i was just basically reinforcing what hag says too and it, it gives the rangers an element that uh quite frankly you know yep. they, they haven't had in a lot of uh, years too so that which to me makes them more dangerous when the playoffs approach Absolutely. Um, and, and the Rangers are another team. The Rangers and the Panthers, I look at as the teams that are the most dangerous going into the playoffs, no question, and have kind of emerged as the teams that you don't want to play uh, in the postseason. Um, they play the Canes tonight, Hags. That ought to be pretty good. Should be. Should be yeah. a very good game. Uh, and I think that's going to be, you know, the Canes have been a little bit of a disappointment, I think, this year. But, like, I think that's also a team that's got a lot of experience that, you know, come playoff time, that could be a little bit of a different story, too, if their goaltending and is – Anderson's uh, back. That's good. Yeah, as long as their goaltending is stable. I, I think that could be an interesting one to watch. Um, all right. Josh Cooper, Zig Fracassi, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, let's also thank Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy plat sports platform in North America and the easiest and most – uh, exciting way to play daily fantasy sports instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks you simply pick more or less than on a two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in for example david posternak you can pick shots on net charlie mcavoy block shots uh you could go um matt rempe and hits absolutely <laughs> all day long uh, and do more or less. So it's fun and pretty simple. Download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit deposit match of up to $100. Download the Prize Picks app today. Very easy to download and use. And use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100 uh, while listening to the Pucks with Hags podcast, which is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS network. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Josh Cooper, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. This was great. Zig, thank you very much for joining us. I hope they turn the lights on. We're